In the early-ish 2000s, I was killing time outside of a small concert venue, and it was going to be a while for the band to start. So I decided to walk around the neighborhood a while and text my friends to see when they were showing up. It wasn't a bad neighborhood, and I didn't feel unsafe walking around, but at night, most things were closed, so there really wasn't anybody else around. As I was walking and looking at my phone, this guy in an SUV, like an Isuzu Rodeo or something, pulled up halfway on the sidewalk right next to me, and he said something like, Hey, do you want to ride? I was slightly startled, but at first I thought he was harmless. To be fair, I was in my skinny jeans, faux hawk emo phase, and he might have thought I looked like a male sex worker. When I looked closer at him, he had his shirt off and was all sweaty and kind of a bigger stocky guy. He tried again in a more seductive sounding voice, saying, Really, I don't mind giving you a ride. I was pretty creeped out, but tried to be friendly. I just kept my distance and said, Thanks, but I'm good. I'm just waiting for a concert to start. Immediately his facial expression changed from friendly to extremely angry and he peeled out down the street so fast that his vehicle was sort of fishtailing. He could have been an undercover cop trying to bust someone for prostitution or just a guy trying to find a sexual encounter. It was in a city in Florida where there are lots of this kind of thing going on, but he gave me serious Jeffrey Dahmer vibes after he got angry and drove off. I got that feeling that if I got into his car, he would have taken me somewhere and put me in his fridge. This happened about a decade ago, when I was 19. At the time, I rented an apartment in a west side neighborhood of Chicago with my sister, who was a year older than me. We both worked hospitality jobs in the city, and we both had pretty robust social lives, so it was fairly typical for one or both of us to get home at weird hours or be out all night. I'd take the pink line to and from work, at this point in my life, I was pretty used to being catcalled walking down the street. I'd been flashed on public transportation a few times. Men would bump into me from behind on packed trains, basically the usual amount of sexual harassment for a young woman living in the city. Not much fazed me. Of course it was uncomfortable, but I was never truly terrified. Until one night. That night, I was coming home from work well after midnight. The train car I was in had been empty for most of the ride. One stop before mine, a man gets on and sits down in my car. Reflexively, I look up as this new passenger entered the car. We made eye contact. Immediately, I felt the hairs stand up on the back of my neck. I knew I'd made a mistake that this might be interpreted as some sort of invitation. I quickly looked away, but felt him watching me as the train pulled away from the station. Since my stop was only one stop away, I decided to wait until the last second to stand up and exit the car, just in case he tried to follow me. Well, he did. He hung back about 30 feet at first, but I felt the gap between us closing and his footsteps were getting louder. Then I hear him trying to catch my attention, saying, Hey. He catches up to me and starts speaking to me like any other man trying to chat me up would. I still couldn't shake the feeling of genuine fear that I'd had since first locking eyes with him when he got on the train. He asks where I'm headed to, and I told him I was going home. He asked if there was anyone waiting up for me this late. I told him my boyfriend was. In reality, I knew my sister was working a night shift and I was going home to an empty apartment. Then, he pulled his shirt to the side, exposing a gun in his waistband. In a joking tone, 
He said he'd fight my boyfriend for me. I laughed along and just kept walking. We were walking down Cermak, which is a pretty busy street, even that late at night. I knew I couldn't let him follow me to my apartment, so when I came to cross the street where I should have turned, I just kept going straight. Eventually, I'd walked far enough that I passed the stop where he had originally got on the train. He walked alongside me for a while, then dropped back and followed me for a while, and eventually stopped. I thought I would be relieved once I'd shaken him, but as soon as I couldn't see him anymore, my fear only heightened. I still had to double back to my apartment somehow, and the trains had stopped running at 2am. I figure he knew I'd walk too far and would have to turn around, so I thought it was possible he was posted up somewhere on Surmark waiting for me. I turned off and walked a few blocks north and then started my one-mile walk back west toward my apartment. The walk back was excruciating. Since I was now off the main road, it was much darker and there was absolutely nobody around. I kept telling myself I had to get home safe for my sister because she'd never be able to live with herself if something happened to me. I kept putting one foot in front of the other and when I finally made it into my apartment and locked the door behind me, I collapsed in a puddle of tears. Ten years later on, I've never felt fear again like I did that night. To this day, I've never told my sister about it. So this happened a couple of hours ago. I came back home for the weekend to spend some time with my family and see a couple of friends. I've been talking to this guy for the last couple of days. He wasn't physically attractive by my standards, but he seemed nice and smart, and I'm not one to get stuck in looks. We decided to meet today around 6-ish. Now, my day was pretty hectic. I had a lot of stuff to do and tomorrow I'm going back to the city where I live and work, so I didn't have much time to do what I had to. I postponed our date by a few hours. His reaction was a little off-putting, but I just blamed my schedule and my inability to estimate how long everything was going to take. I apologized multiple times, and after some snarky comments, he said it was okay. A friend of mine gave me a lift and dropped me off near the meeting point, we finally meet, and boy was I catfished. Besides the fact that he looked completely different from his pictures, he told me he's an aerospace engineer in Austria, and he's also visiting home now. Turns out, he's just dreaming about becoming that, because he was actually unemployed, living with his parents in a small village near my hometown. All in all, I felt uncomfortable right away and he was giving off really weird vibes. I instantly thought about ways of ending the date as early as possible. We were supposed to get a drink in a pub, but I asked him to stay outside a little more because I wanted to smoke before. Ten minutes into the date, and it was dreadful. I almost told him it can't and won't work, so it's better to go home and not waste any more time. I was debating if I should tell him that or not while I was walking over to the trash can to throw away my cigarette. When I got back, I was looking at him and didn't see the hole in the sidewalk, and I fell so bad I almost started crying. I twisted my left ankle and my right knee became so swollen incredibly fast and it was really bad. I couldn't walk and was in pretty serious pain but he insisted we go in and drink something. I kept telling him no, I wasn't in any state to do that, and frankly, I didn't want to. I was low-key glad I had a way out. I called a friend and asked if she could pick me up, begged almost. He insisted to drive me home, but I didn't want to, so we agreed that he would walk me to my friend's car. Everything was weird, and when we got to the car, he turned to me and said, Wait, 
that's not the same car you came here in. I said no, and asked him how he knew that. I was quite afraid at this point. He told me that he was behind me when I arrived at the meeting point. Now, I don't know if that's just a coincidence, but the guy is really creepy, and he keeps messaging me. I think I'll block him, and now I'm sitting with my leg up on a chair with an ice pack on my knee, which almost doubled in size on a Saturday night, thinking about how I get myself into these types of situations. The mall I was at just had shots fired. People were fighting and someone pulled a gun. He shot this guy in the chest like three times. He turned around and started pointing it into the crowd. I fucking booked it, obviously. I was with three friends, two of which were from out of town. We were in the hallway of the second level and the closest exit was through a JCP, a big ass store with multiple levels. Shots started again and people could hear the pops, but they were just standing still, looking confused. I started yelling as loud as I could to get the fuck out, to get outside and that shots were fired. I can still see the faces of this older couple when they realized what was happening. It was insane. My friends were sobbing and I wanted to break down right there, but I was the one who had driven and I had to stay calm. I don't know what to do or how to feel. It started out as a fight. My friends and I started recording it like the dumbass teenagers we are. We got a video of this guy dropping. I have never run so hard in my life. I had to throw up. I went through army basic training, but here I had to stop to vomit twice. I just got home. I don't even know what to do. I'm not stupid and I'm 18 years old and I know not to stick around for public fights. I know that and I still did it. I still stayed, recorded, put my friends in danger. I need to grow the fuck up. A roommate of mine had some rough months with health, school, girlfriend, and family problems, all cropping up at once. He decided to go for a hike to some waterfalls outside of Tucson, Arizona, and take some mushrooms to do some soul searching and reflection. The hike in and out from the falls has a really steep hill, but right before the parking area is a 15-foot cliff with stairs cut along the face. He was hiking out when he got the feeling he was being watched. He stopped and looked until he locked eyes with a smallish mountain lion maybe 40 feet away that was across a small ravine between two hills. He said he nearly shat himself and it took all of his focus to not sprint to the truck. Keeping eyes on the cat, he begins working his way up the hill back to the truck. He's creeping along to his right keeping eyes on the cat in front of him when he hears a branch break behind him. Expecting to see someone walking down from the lot, he yells and turns to warn them. Instead of a person, he saw a second, much larger mountain lion that was 20 feet away uphill behind him, and he realized he was stuck between two mountain lions, with one closer to his truck than he is, and he does not have the high ground. He does the only thing he can think to do, pick up a good sized rock and keep creeping. He's focusing more on the larger, closer lion and just keeping taps on the smaller one and tries to walk out until he's now uphill of the large cat who's just crouched walking to him. He gets close to the stairs and realizes he's lost the smaller one. He worries it's in the lot above him but there's no other way to escape, so he walks up the stairs backwards while keeping an eye on the big cat. The truck is only five feet away, 
He now spots the movement of the smaller cat in the ravine, heading towards the trail he just walked through, and the larger cat. He manages to get in the truck and gets the fuck out of that lot. He then drives down the mountain to our place while finally allowing himself to feel the panic attack that's been happening, and he's also on the come down from a mushroom trip. The guy actually passed away cliff jumping at those falls a year or two later. Rest in peace, Hunter. I love you, brother. I was out partying this Friday night with four of my female friends, two of which I've just met that evening. We were having drinks at a club in Central Europe. We were dancing and talking. All of us had fun. At around 2 a.m., the girls grabbed a taxi and went home. I stayed a little longer at the club to finish my drink. I danced on the stage for about 20 minutes. Then I grabbed a taxi and went home. When I got to the street that I live on, my drunk ass realized that I had no keys and there was no way to get into my house as I lived alone. So I called another taxi and went back to the club to look for my keys. First I went to the bar to inquire if anyone had turned in any lost keys to them that night. Unfortunately, they didn't have my keys, so I started to look for them in the club in every place that I was in that night. I turned the flashlight on my phone and had been looking for my keys in a mass of people. About 10 minutes go by and I haven't found anything apart from broken glass and cigarette butts. I went back to the place where I was initially looking for them. This is the place where I was hanging out and drinking with the girls. I started to look for my keys on the sitting benches instead of the ground. I remember I had my keys inside the pocket of my jacket, as I always do, and my jacket was placed on the corner of that bench the entire night before I left. There were people on the benches, and they had their jackets on it too. I sat down near the corner where I was sitting before, and beside me was a guy with lines of some drugs on his phone, freely giving them to other people. He had put his jacket in the corner of the bench, and I wanted to look at that area to see if my keys had been pushed into the corner or something. I picked up his jacket, and to my surprise, my keys were right under his jacket in the middle of the bench. I was so happy to find my keys. I was drunk and started pretty much yelling how happy I am to have found them as I was getting so desperate at that moment. There was a guy on that bench that I met with the girls before in the club. His name was Luke. He was really nice during the whole night and so I kept talking to Luke when I found my keys. I even went to the bar and grabbed another beer just to talk to Luke a bit longer. I went to have a piss in the toilet, and when I came back, Luke had found himself an acquaintance which he was talking to, so I just started to finish my beer while I smoked a cigarette and was getting ready to go home. This is when the guy that had lines of some drugs on his phone started to talk to me. His name was Pedro, as it was definitely a fake name that he gave me. I've been talking with him in English. Pedro was 19 years old and he was from Colombia. He told me stories about his life in Colombia and how his family struggles. He told me that his father had recently died and he's the oldest son, so he's in Slovakia trying to make money for the family. He even showed me photos of him and his family back in Colombia. I sympathized with Pedro and I was feeling sorry for him. After about 20 minutes, Lucas scored with a girl that he met, and he said that they're going home. He asked Pedro if he had any MDMA on him, and he sold some to them. Luke left with the girl. People around on the bench saw this happening, and so they wanted some drugs from Pedro. So he started to make lines on his phone again. I told Pedro that I'm going home, and wished him the best of luck. I grabbed my jacket and started walking. This is when Pedro called out to me and stopped me. He said that it's late and he should go back to the hotel too. He brushed the drugs from his phone onto the table, took his belongings and told the people there that they can finish whatever was left for free. 
Pedro and I left the underground club. When we were outside, he asked me if I could walk him to his hotel, which was nearby, a five minute walk apparently. He told me in the club that he has no friends and no family in Slovakia. I really sympathized with him. I told him that, sure, I can walk him to the hotel. We were talking the whole way and he was saying really nice things to me, like how I understood his situation and how good of a person I was. When we arrived at the hotel, the door was closed and he messaged someone to come and open the door for him. He asked if I wanted to have one last beer with him, to which I said, sure, but I will have to be on my way once I finish the beer. Some girl came and opened the door for us. They spoke in Spanish as they greeted each other. The hotel itself didn't really look like a public hotel. There was a reception and stairs up, and on the left was a dining room. Pedro told me to wait for him in the dining room. The time was about 5 a.m. now. I went to the dining room, and there was a girl sitting with her laptop. I greeted her with, Hola, and sat down. Pedro came back maybe three to five minutes later with two opened cans of some beverage. There was a parrot and a Jack Daniels logo. The color of the can was gold, I think. This is the moment that I should have been suspicious and not drank from an open can. My naive and drunk ass overlooked this fact, and I drank from the can. I was talking with Pedro about all the drug cartels in Colombia and how their politics is fucked up. After about 10 minutes, I started to feel weird, and I looked at my phone. My hands and eyes were tingling. I was quickly aware of what was happening now. I turned on the location and mobile data on my phone, and I put my phone in a different pocket than I usually did that night. Pedro started to ask me how I'm feeling, to which my adrenaline levels blow up. I started to think that I'm being abducted by some Colombian human trafficking ring. My sight started to weirdly tingle, and the lights were blinding me. My jaw was fucked up as I was pushing my teeth together. I have taken drugs in the past, and this felt like a stimulant and a disassociative, which was really weird for me to understand. I tried to keep my voice calm and my mind present. I told Pedro that I know what's going on and I asked him why he gave me the stimulant if he needs me unconscious. Pedro's hands started to shake, and he didn't want to answer me. The girl with the laptop looked right into my eyes, the first time that she even moved her body. Pedro grabbed his phone and started to write something to somebody on WhatsApp. I told Pedro that there was a mistake in the dose, and that I'm fine apart from having been unknowingly drugged. I think that Pedro had drugged me back in the club while I went to the toilet, which was why he quickly got up when I was leaving. Everything I said, Pedro rewrote to somebody else, and he always waited for an incoming message before saying anything to me. I started to talk to the girl too, told her that I didn't give a fuck about what they were doing there, but I'm walking out. At one moment, I remember saying that I get what Pedro is doing, but I don't get what the girl's part was in all of this, all while pointing my finger at her. Pedro gets a notification on his phone, and he told me that he's sorry and that I can go home if I want to. I didn't respond to him. I got my drugged ass up, and as I was walking out of the dining room, I stopped by the girl with her laptop, stared right into her eyes, and out my right hand in a fist bump. She looked me in my eyes, gave me a fist bump, and did a weird grimace on her face. I walked to the doors at the reception, which were closed. I started to kick and punch the doors while yelling, open the fucking door. The receptionist did, and I walked out. My heart was pumping, my whole body was shaking. I was feeling both dizzy and awake. I ran to a main street, and I was calling my mom to come get me, and to do it as fast as possible but I didn't know where I was. I was feeling disassociated and couldn't really comprehend what just happened. As I got to a main street where a bus stop was, I started to feel very paranoid. 
There was a white Mercedes SUV that stopped right in the middle near the bus stop that I was at. The car's lights shut off, and whoever it was just sat there. I told all of this to my mom, and she told me to look for a camera. There was one at the bus stop, so I stood right underneath it to make sure that I was seen. I was feeling and talking weirdly, to which my mom told me to talk to her, to tell her what I could see around me. I have seen a few people that walk to the main street. Everybody was on their phone and occasionally looking up at me. One guy came close to the bus stop and I approached him while I still had my mom on the phone. I asked him what he wanted from me and he says, I'm sorry, I don't know you, to which I said that I'm sorry. After about 10 minutes of me being on the phone with my mom, the white SUV turned on the engine and left. My mom arrived by car soon after. I was walking to her car on the road, but I couldn't walk properly. I felt paranoid, tons of adrenaline going through my body. My heart was pumping so fast, I thought I was going to have some kind of seizure. I managed to get into my mom's car. She was in her pajamas. She was so scared. I started to tell her everything that happened. I told her to drive around the city instead of driving me home in case these people were following us. We were driving around for maybe an hour, talking about what happened during the night. I told her how the inside of the building looked and all. My jaw was going so crazy that my mom could hear it, and she was really scared for me. The whole ride, I was feeling really weird. At one point, I felt like my soul left my body. I can't really describe it. I didn't really feel like myself, like I'm not real. Lights were blinding me, and my vision was blurred and tingling, like my eyes were going up and down all the time. I didn't feel any rushes of euphoria or anything. I thought that they gave me some mix of drugs. I got back home at around 7.30am. My mom stayed with me, comforting me. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. We were talking about going to the police, and also about if I'm in any kind of danger anymore. At around 11am, I fell asleep. During this time, my mom cleaned my apartment, and my sister came to visit me. I don't know what I would do without my family. One of my female friends that was with me during that night came to visit me. As I talked to her, I thought that I was going through some kind of episode like schizophrenic or something. Like why the hell would I be a target of something like this? I'm a chubby bearded guy. Why would they want to abduct me? I'm afraid of going to the police as our police department and politics are very corrupt and they have always worked with any kind of mafia for as long as I can remember. They would take my testimony, start to investigate, and then they would be stopped by their officials. I still don't fully believe that what happened to me was an experience with a human trafficking ring. However, there are so many red flags from what I can remember. Why would Pedro be scared after I called them out? Why would he stop talking to me unless someone sent him a message on his phone? Why would he even start to message somebody during our conversation? Why the fuck? Would he drug me without me knowing it? But ultimately, why the fuck would they let me go? So, Pedro, the two girls from the weird hotel, and possibly the Colombian human trafficking ring, let's not fucking meet ever again. I worked as an overnight security guard back in 2007 for an electronics slash manufacturing company. They had four large warehouses that I checked throughout the night. Only one of the warehouses was used for production and also contained the C-suites. They did have one or two employees there overnight, but it wasn't unusual for me not to see them during a shift. As I was walking through the offices and C-suites, I checked every door to make sure they were locked. 
They also had some supply closets that I checked as well, but they didn't need to be locked. So I'm going along, checking each door and opening each closet. I pull open a closet door, and the man on the floor sits up. I screamed, Jesus Christ, and immediately slammed at the door. My entire body was shaking with adrenaline. After just a second, I realized he must be an employee, so I opened the door again to inquire why he was in there. Apparently he's a diabetic and sometimes lays down somewhere quiet and out of the way when he doesn't feel good. I still thought it was a strange place to lay down, but holy shit, that has to have been the scariest moment I had. My folks and I live right at the edge of a fairly big national forest. The back four acres or so of our property was fenced in so the dogs could run, but they constantly found ways out, and we had to patch holes or fill in digs. This had gone on for months and was just a part of life now. One night, I was getting home fairly late, and as I got out of my car, my pappy hollered from somewhere in the woods along the fence. Hey, since you're home, can you give me a hand? The person I was on the phone with heard him and said they'd let me go since it sounded like I had a fence to fix. I hollered back that I was going to set my stuff in the house and I'd be right there. When I opened the door to set my stuff down, my pappy was sound asleep in the recliner in the living room. And as soon as I saw him, every hair on me stood on end. I practically dove inside, shut the door, and slammed that deadbolt home like I was trying to drive it into the doorframe. I don't know what was calling me from the woods, but I know it definitely wasn't my dad. I was working at a medium-sized radiator factory. It required a foot patrol every two hours and a CCTV patrol every hour in between. It was a Friday night shift and the factory was shut down for maintenance one weekend, so I was told that the engineers would shut the compressed air system down before leaving. It's normally my task once the last shift engineers left. It got to around midnight and I had just finished patrolling the offices and entered the factory floor. All the lights were off, so it was just me, my torch, and a bank of amber safety lights on top of various presses, welders, etc. As I walked down the side of the factory line, there was this almighty hissing noise which came from the direction of the air compressor shed. Needless to say, my pants went from black to brown, the engineers hadn't shut down the system as stated, and the pressure relief valve decided to open. I had a great time writing up my near-miss report, because as you know, pressurized manufacturing equipment is dangerous. This was maybe six to seven years ago, I have photos on my camera still, I think, but I haven't charged it in ages. I gave up on photography. You know how hard it is, so I hope that you all will just trust me. So we've been going on these trips as a family for a really long time now, probably 17 years if I had to guess. I won't say where we go, but it's the Australian bush just to give you all an idea of the setting. Anyway, we've had a few creepy experiences there but nothing inexplicable. But this event still weirds me out, and I can't really think of anything that explains it. The year of this, my sister, cousin, dad, and myself all drove up together and were the first to arrive at the house. We had to wait for my grandma to arrive with the key, so my dad sat on the deck with a beer, and my sister and cousin and I went on a little journey. The three of us made our way to a little creek not far from the house, that we nicknamed Bridge to Terabithia 
because of a tree that had fallen and acted as a bridge for us to use to get across the creek. This creek never had water in it though and was not deep or wide. We could easily walk through it, but the tree was fun. Anyways, my cousin makes an off-the-cuff comment as we walk across the tree, asking, sort of sarcastically, is there something dead around here? Because of how many flies there were. Lo and behold, we get to the other side and there was something dead. We were greeted with a dead kangaroo. Nothing too jarring. I had seen plenty on the side of the road, but this one was cut clean in half. And when I say clean, I mean clean. Like it was a perfect half. There wasn't an ounce of blood on the fur. No blood on the ground. And the top half was nowhere to be found. I happened to have my camera on me and took some photos of it. Then my cousin poked it with a stick and hundreds of flies came rushing out. My cousin and sister kept poking at it, trying to move it into the creek. But a fully grown kangaroo, even half of one, isn't exactly light. Their sticks broke, so I grabbed it by the tail and pulled it into the creek so that we could bury it. But really, we just covered it with sticks and flowers. We looked around up top everywhere for the second half or a trace of what might have happened to it, but we couldn't find anything. We ended up going back down into the creek and walking through it, looking for something, and what we found only made it even more confusing. We found, if I'm remembering correctly, four dead rabbits, but only their bottom halves, all lined up neatly along the floor of the creek until it reached thick brush that we couldn't walk through. Same thing with these rabbits though, no top halves to be found, no blood anywhere, and cut clean in half. When I was 27, my girlfriend lived in a shitty part of Hollywood, Florida, near US-1. She had a kid pretty young, but the dad ended up going to jail for assault. The place she could afford was run down as fuck, with all sorts of addicts and genuine lowlifes living in the units around her. She hated the place. She couldn't move in with me because I was just renting a room where I lived. It was better than living at her parents, though. A drunk, abusive dad addict mom. I went to visit her after my shift ended at 9pm. I picked some food up and planned to cook for her. We were there for about an hour just sitting on the couch watching her kid play with a box. Then the banging started on the door. She looks terrified thinking it's her ex. I'm kind of freaked out also because I heard all these stories about him. Some guy is cursing hitting something against the door hard. We didn't even want to peek through the window or peephole, thinking he's got a gun. We call the police, but the operator is having a tough time hearing. Then we hear some other woman screaming and cursing. The guy had the wrong door. We hear them start fighting, smashing, more screaming. It sounds like she's spitting and we hear punches. We're not sure if it's her or him but it is loud. The 911 operator says police are on their way. The kid starts screaming because he's scared. The man outside starts banging on the door again. He thinks his kid is with us and shouts he's going to kill us for taking his kid. My girlfriend just breaks down at this point and starts crying. Maybe 10 minutes later, the police arrive. They arrest both of them and took our statements. My girlfriend moved out a couple of days later, and we ended up renting another shitty apartment, but in a much better area. When I was a teenager, my bedroom was in the basement. You could clearly hear any time someone came down the stairs, and my bed was creaky, like lay down, sit, or move. 
and the springs would let anyone nearby know Creaky. I was just starting to fall asleep one night and heard footsteps. I thought, no big deal, it's probably my mom coming to do the laundry. I fell back asleep. I felt pressure on the bed behind me and it creaked. Everything in me was screaming, don't move, don't move, just lay here and don't move. I eventually fell asleep out of exhaustion. This happened multiple times, and one night I'd had enough of being terrified, and when I heard the creak and felt the pressure next to me, I rolled over and sat up. Nothing. There was nobody physically there. I've experienced things before that and since, but that was the one that freaked me out the most. I'm from South Africa and work an office job at night. I have been for the past eight years or so, and so I've become quite accustomed to being awake at night. Too much so, in fact as one night I had car trouble and decided to walk to work, despite the inherent danger posed by my country's incredibly high rate of crime and poverty. Anyway, so I get to work safely, apart from having to navigate my way around the poor sleeping on corners and in the overhanging entrances of stores sealed up for the night. It's no exaggeration to point out the poverty here is truly horrible and that these people suffer every indignity you could possibly imagine by no fault of their own, but an unlucky birth. On my way home, I decided to take a side street off the main road I'd previously walked to avoid the aforementioned homeless, and in doing so, I made a huge mistake. I was around halfway down a poorly lit side street at around 1am in the pitch black cold morning when I hear someone whistle behind me. I turn and there was a gangly looking silhouette of a man, dimly lit by a flickering street light, gesturing at me. Naturally, I was pretty freaked out, and so I turned and started walking as quickly as possible, just shy of running in fact. But just as I turned, I could hear his shuffling steps speeding up behind me. This is where it gets a little muddled in memory. I then heard another whistle, similar to the first one, coming from in front of me. And to my left, I hear someone hoarsely bark something in a language I don't understand. I froze for a second, realized that I was likely being cornered by at least three people, and then kicked in the face. My face and upper body felt red hot in the crisp night air. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears, and I was suddenly drenched in sweat. All it took was seeing a glint of something metallic in my peripheral vision to set me off, and I ran. I ran faster than I've ever run before. It was like my body didn't even need air for it. I took off down the street, narrowly dodged what I assume was the second assailant, who vaulted over a churchyard wall through the courtyard in front of the church, over the back wall into a school sports center, and across a wet sports field, over another boundary wall at least 1.5 times my height, and onto the main street, which was thankfully busy enough that cars passed by every minute or so. From there, I walked home while constantly looking over my shoulder, and never ever walked home at night again. I'm certain I'd have been robbed, and pretty sure I'd have sustained substantial injuries had they caught me. I'm so thankful that, in the moment, my lizard brain said, run, and not fight, because I would have lost badly. Hello. To start this story, I want to say I've not seen anything like this in my life. At the time, I was 15 years old, pet-sitting a friend's dogs while they were out of town and in Benson, Arizona, where this took place. This property had a lot of acres 
and it took about 15 minutes to get to their little house, right in the middle of probably about 75 acres. At the time, it was about, I'd say, 10 p.m. My friend had eight dogs, and they usually stayed outside for the most part, because they were big watchdogs who seemed to have been able to defend themselves in the past. Before everything happened, I was inside their tiny home making food, and when I heard her biggest dog start squealing kind of quietly, very scared and in pain, but loud enough for me to hear, I knew these sounds were unusual for this dog to be making. I shot up and ran outside to see what was going on. I thought maybe the dog might have hurt himself or something similar, but this was not the case, and I ended up seeing a five to six foot tall, pale, very skinny creature hunched over this dog, sucking on its head. I was very stunned, almost too stunned to speak, but I managed to shake that feeling off. I start yelling at this thing because the dog started yelping loud. I'm telling the creature to get out of here and trying to scare it. I run over to the dog as fast as I could because I've heard of these things before and I know they would likely eat the dog if I didn't do something, but I stop about 10 feet in front of it to see this creature jump up and run away as fast as it can. I couldn't help but keep looking over my shoulder the rest of the time I was there. I also didn't let those dogs out at night, and I didn't care to go out there either. So when my friends came back, I told everyone what happened and what I saw. I felt like everyone was just as frightened as I was, and it made me even more unsettled. I ended up leaving that desert and didn't look back. To this day, I still don't know what to make about it, except I know it was something demonic. This happened eight years ago, almost to the day. I was living in one city and working in another city about 20 minutes away. Since then, the areas between have been hugely developed, but at the time, everything between these cities was just undeveloped back roads with nothing around. No buildings, no sidewalks, no lights, just rough old roads until you get into the other city. To get to work on time, I had to leave my house at 3.30 a.m. One morning, I jolted awake at 3.20, full of adrenaline, as I realized I'd only had 10 minutes to get myself ready and set my dog up to be alone while I was at work. Needless to say, the circumstance had me highly alert, rushing and focused. Also, I was driving a lot faster. I drive down this road every day as I went to work. I usually take that time to wake up, but this time I was wide awake. All I could think about was what would happen if I ended up being late. I was really anxious. Suddenly, my headlights shone upon something in the distance ahead of me. What I saw was a naked, skinless man crossing the road on foot. When I say skinless, imagine those diagrams in your life science classes, everything beneath the skin revealed and intact, except in this case with a shiny or wet appearance, bright pinks and reds all over, like a living, skinless person. No clothes, no shoes, and notably, appearing oddly content. He seemed strangely at ease, considering he was crossing the road into nothingness, in front of a speeding car, in the dark, at 3.45 a.m. There was no walking space suitable for humans out there for miles. The area he was walking into was pitch black, nothing there but weeds and rocks. The direction he was coming from, the same. No light, nowhere to roam, nothing. Was I tripping or what? I was sober and really awake.
In the late 90s, I accompanied my mom to England so she could see where her grandparents had lived. I was basically just there to look after her because my dad didn't want to come and my mom has a hard time doing things for herself. Our agreement was that after spending a week in England, the second week we could spend in Ireland, but my mom is terrible at planning, so we ended up spending a week sort of in limbo in Liverpool waiting for the Irish Sea to calm down so we could cross on a ferry. It was September, probably the worst month to try crossing, and we never made it to Ireland. So anyways, for five days, I had to try to find places for us to sleep at night because she also made no hotel reservations for our entire two-week stay, and I was completely unaware of this until we were already in England. I picked a hotel that seemed okay, and my mom paid to sleep in a different room because she has really bad RLS and shakes violently at night. It keeps everybody up. In the middle of the night, I heard a man yelling in the hallway. He had to have been very intoxicated. He was pounding on the doors all the way down the hall and hitting the walls. Being the punk-ass kid I was, I made the mistake of acknowledging his rage by telling him to shut up. This really enraged him. He started beating on my door, screaming he was going to kill me. He tried the doorknob, and thank God those doors had an automatic lock. I started looking around the room and realized this hotel has no phones in the room. Like I said, this was the 90s. I went to the window, but I was three floors up and the windows didn't open either. So, I just stayed there, listening as he did his best to break the door down, while threatening what he was going to do to me once he opened the door. This went on for at least 20 minutes. Somehow, I finally fell asleep. When I woke up the next day, I saw just how much damage he had done. He smashed in my door with a fire extinguisher that he pulled off of the wall. There were dents and marks all down the hall where he had dragged it violently from end to end. The worst part was my mom, down the hall, never said anything. When I told the clerk as we were checking out, he looked at me like I was crazy and making it up. I told him, just go look. Later, I asked my mom about it. And she said, oh yes, I thought I heard you screaming. Was that you crying for help? I had a patient actively passing away with his three adult sons when my shift started at 7 p.m. They all left and wanted to be notified after his passing. I had a student nurse who was in her early 20s, and one of the sons kept making inappropriate comments to her. All of the sons were in their 40s. Just extra creepy comments to the point I had to point blank say, This is inappropriate. Please don't talk to my student like that. Note, I may be 25 at the time. Anyway, the dad passes at around 1am, with just me and my student there and I call his creepy son, who was the point of contact. He wants to come up and spend time with him to say goodbye. Okay, cool. We have the body cleaned up and peaceful, and he comes in and spends about a minute with his dad before asking me about the next steps. I tell him we're going to take him to the morgue, call the funeral home who'll come pick him up, and then they will arrange everything else with the family in the morning. He gets extra interested in our trip to the morgue. The hairs on the back of my neck immediately stood up. He was asking, who was going? Was it just us wheeling him down? Is the morgue in the basement like you see on TV? Did we need a big strong man to accompany us down there so nothing happened? All the while, staring at my student. It was so creepy. I very cheerfully told him that security was already on their way to escort us down there, and I've never seen someone leave a hospital room so quickly. Out of my ten years working nights in an ICU, 
That was by far the most unnerving. I worked for a cleaning company in college. One of my assignments was a church. This wasn't a Christian run-of-the-mill church. I'm not sure what they worshipped, but the hours were flexible. I basically could clean it at any day of the week before Saturday morning. One day, I had a lot of work to do, and I didn't finish until about 7 p.m. on a Friday, so I needed to go up that night. This place was in the middle of nowhere. I've cleaned there probably 60 times, but usually during the day, and it takes on average about 2-3 to three hours. I get there around 9pm, and the place is pitch black. So I go room to room, turning on the lights, and as I'm walking back, the lights I turned on keep turning off. I'm like, okay, they're probably on a motion sensor, and I think nothing of it. I see movement from one of the rooms, and I get a bit freaked out. I walk over to investigate, and there is a man, who I am assuming worked at the church, shutting off the lights. I say, sorry sir, I have to clean. He just stares at me. I think maybe he doesn't speak English, so I turn the light on, and he kind of grunts at me. The rest of the time I'm cleaning, he watches me, and turns off every light that I turn on after I move from that room. I called my boss the next morning and asked if he could contact the owner and ask if I have to clean again at night or in the evenings to let that man know I need light to clean properly. The owner replied, no one from his congregation was in the building last night. I was freaked out and assumed that someone followed me or broke in while I was cleaning. Nothing ever came out of it. But every time I think back, I get little shivers in my spine. This is a longer one, but I swear I was almost murdered in college. In college, some buddies of mine and I developed the habit of walking the train tracks at night. It was peaceful and usually quiet, a good way to get away from campus and its baggage and talk. One night a friend and I were walking and we went further down the line than usual. Without realizing it, we'd gotten well out of the city and into the woods. We continue on for a little while. Most of the lights were gone and there was brush and trees all around us with a small trailer home just visible ahead. Suddenly, without a word, we both stopped dead in our tracks, overwhelmed with a completely unspoken feeling of being both watched and in extreme danger. We wait and listen, and hearing nothing but the wind in the tall grass around us, we both hurriedly agree it's time to turn back. We keep a quick pace for about ten minutes, hyper alert, and constantly listening for any strange sounds or movement. The whole trip still engulfed in a pervasive sense of near panic at this unseen sense of danger. Bear in mind that we're both typically very difficult to rattle. Finally, we clear the trees and get back to what we called the junction, an intersection of two tracks with a switcher near some warehouses and also where there is significant light again. We make it about a hundred yards into this area after our ten minutes or so of speed walking and feeling no less in danger but a need to investigate. We paused to assess the situation on an open and reasonably well lit ground. To this day, I can see the silhouette just barely visible, standing barely beyond the edge of the light in the gap between the two tracks, staring directly at us. We walked those tracks many times, so what I saw wasn't the trick of unfamiliar terrain. To this day, it still gives me chills. We moved very quickly the remainder of the way back to campus, the feeling of extreme danger 
only slowly fading once we got well back onto campus. I've never been able to shake that sight or the strangeness of the unspoken but simultaneous sense of extreme danger we were both overwhelmed by. About ten years ago, I was hunting. I was in a stand a good quarter of a mile or so from any roads, surrounded by trees and brush. It was getting dark, and while there was some light, there wasn't enough to see anything in the woods. So I decided to get out of the stand and start walking up a game trail I'd come down while I could still see enough of the trail to walk out. I got about a hundred yards up the trail when it happened. Off to my right, not far from the trail, I heard this horrible sound, like a cross between a baby crying and a woman screaming. It has been virtually silent in the woods, and the sudden scream was just so piercing to my ears. Immediately following the scream, the brush about ten yards from me shook violently, and the creature took off down through the woods along the trail in the direction I'd just come from. I never saw it. I only saw some of the brush moving as it ran. Well, my firearm was immediately up, as I had no idea what I just saw, and my mind was racing about a million miles a second. I took off up the trail as fast as I could walk, rifle at the ready, in case whatever that thing was decided to come back my way. I made it to the road where my quad was parked and immediately jumped on it and tried to start it. The only issue was that the quad refused to start. In the back of my head, I was pissed more than scared at this point, because I kept thinking I'm going to die in the most stereotypical horror movie way, and that really annoyed me. Finally, after several minutes, the quad finally started, and I rushed back to camp as quickly as I could. I later found out, after talking to several of the guys at the camp, that what I ran into was a bobcat, virtually harmless to humans unless you corner them or something. Turns out, they have an absolutely terrifying scream, and if you're bored, I certainly recommend looking up videos of it, because it's freaky. Unfortunately for me, this was my first encounter with one, and I was not thrilled with the experience. the summer of 2019, I was house-sitting for my dad while he was away for work. The house is in the middle of nowhere and barely even on Google Maps. Usually when friends would come over, I would have to drive to the top of the nearest paved road and lead them down a few more paved streets to my dad's place. I'd had a few drinks with friends and had been dropped off by my friend that lived close by. He dropped me off at the side of the house because it was easier for him to turn around there. So I walked up the stairs and entered with my key through the side door that led to the kitchen. The kitchen overlooked the front garden, but the front door was nestled into a small porch and wasn't visible to me. I saw movement in the front garden while I was making tea in the kitchen and immediately turned off the lights. There was a man trying to look through the kitchen windows from the garden. He ended up walking around to the wall-to-ceiling glass doors around the back of the house, cupping his hands to the glass and trying to look in. I wasn't completely sober that night, so I remember just thinking the situation didn't seem real. He couldn't see me in the dark, but I was hiding behind the wall that separated the kitchen from the dining room slash lounge area. I had stupidly not locked one of the glass doors closer to the front door and he started entering the house in the pitch black, not realizing I was maybe ten feet away from him. I'd already called the friend who dropped me off, as I knew he was still nearby. Knowing his parents, the ex-military, kept a gun in a safe in the truck. I remember just wanting to run, get out of the house ASAP. The situation didn't feel real at all. It was like something from a movie. I was acting on adrenaline, but if I ran, I'd be alone in the middle of nowhere, 
with a deranged man chasing after me. As the guy walked further into the house, I stepped out and pulled a knife on him. Again, I was not sober. It was a very stupid thing to do. He tried to incoherently make conversation, but I got him out of the door just as my friend pulled up with his gun. The guy bolted to his car that was parked in an area concealed by the trees on our property. Turns out, he was the gardener. He'd been keeping tabs on me, knew I was house-sitting alone for my dad while he was out of town, was very high on meth, and had been waiting on the front porch for me to come home. Except I'd used the side door that night, something I never usually did. If I hadn't used the side door that night, I have no idea what would have happened. I also have no idea what would have happened if my friend hadn't come back when I called him, because the guy was starting to get aggressive and trying to come towards me right when my friend got there with his gun out. We like to joke about it now, but it was the worst scenario I've ever experienced, where I wanted to just run and get away. I did solo backpacking in September in grizzly bear country. Bears are in hyperflagia at this time of year, aka hungry as fuck, eating everything they can find to prepare for hibernation. They can be easily agitated and often behave unpredictably during hyperflagia. Anyways, I was exploring some off-trail lakes about 13 miles from the trailhead. On the hike in, I noted multiple sets of bear prints and fairly fresh scat as well, so it was obvious bears were in the area. Not really a problem as long as your bear etiquette is on point, just a presence that adds to the natural awe of the area and makes you pay closer attention to your surroundings and make your presence known. Unhabituated bears will generally avoid humans, so making noise like clapping or singing is the safest way to travel through bear country. I set up camp at a beautiful lake late in the afternoon and then packed up my camera gear and set off to another nearby lake with the intention to take some sunset photos and some Milky Way photos later on. It was wonderful, beautiful, peaceful. The only downside was some fairly thick wildfire smoke slowly coming over the mountain. Oh well. That's just fire season in Montana for you. But I noticed something a bit concerning as the smoke rolled in. The light from my headlamp would catch and reflect off the smoke particles, severely reducing my visibility to only 10 or 15 feet. It was like being in a dense fog. Still not a big problem as the walk back to camp was fairly simple. After some successful astrophotography despite the smoke, I realized my headlamp was starting to dim and simultaneously realized I was out of extra batteries. I immediately packed up my gear and started the walk back to my tent at the other lake. The visibility was absolutely shit with the thick smoke and dying batteries, but as I crested the hill between the two lakes and pointed my headlamp in the direction of camp, the light caught two sets of eyes. My heart skipped a beat, or maybe three. My mind naturally jumped to bears, and the only reason there would be two bears hanging together this time of year is if it was a sow and cub. Now, most bears don't pose a danger to humans if you know how to act in bear country, but a mother bear will protect her cubs and will eliminate any perceived threat. I was freaking the fuck out but I knew I had to get back to my tent. I started yelling towards those eyes to let them know a human was in the area and hoped that would encourage them to go away. I undid the safety straps of my bear spray on one hip and my pistol on the other hip and began moving towards the little light I had left on in my tent. I could really only make out the ground directly in front of me. Everything else was a blur of smoke particles and my headlamp was only getting dimmer. I kept scanning for the glinting eyes I'd seen from the top of the hill, but I couldn't find them. I hoped 
they had fled the area from my noise and light and weren't waiting to ambush me behind some boulder. I made it back to the tent, but I didn't get much sleep that night. Moral of the story, always bring more headlamp batteries than you think you will need. I went to take some nighttime photos of a local historic building which was condemned, but had been used to house scientists in the 1940s. I went there with three of my friends around midnight. It was a rundown two-story U-shaped building with a third floor that only covered small parts of the building. It also had a rundown pool that had a busted up fence still around it. Two of my friends go around to the right side of the building and I went to the left with my other friend. As we came around the very back side of the building, we noticed that there was a window that did not have its curtains closed. We looked in, and on the left side of the room is a desk covered in massive amounts of dust with the exception of a singular handprint on the desk. The chair to the desk was half cocked to the side as though somebody had recently been sitting there. On the right side of the room was a bed that was made with an ugly color green comforter neatly tucked down with two white pillows. The bed was completely tucked and neat as though it was a fake bed model in a Barbie house. The back and to the left was the door, which was boarded up from the outside rather extensively it looked. We thought it was weird, but figured that maybe somebody had snuck inside. We tried to take pictures but both of our cameras were dead. We start heading back around to the front of the building, expecting to get our phones out of the car. So we get back to the front side of the building and meet my other two friends there. Wondering why they were there, we explained what happened and that our cameras were dead. As we explained it though, we hear glass shatter towards the side of the building where the room was. We look up and there is a broken window up on the third floor attic room. Thinking there might be homeless people in there, we make our way back to the front of the building, and as we come around the corner, there's a police officer waiting there. Apparently there's an agreement with the people who live up the hill from this building that they would watch over the building and call the police if they saw anything suspicious. Explaining that I was just there to take photos, the officer seemed irritated to have to respond to the call. He didn't seem comfortable being there as though as he'd already had some run-ins with the place. I apologized to the officer because I didn't know that I wasn't allowed to take pictures of this local landmark, and then I explained that he might want to do a check for homeless people or drug users inside, and when he asked why, I explained the breaking glass. He asks us to show him where it was, so we took him over to that side of the building. When we walked, not only was the glass no longer broken, the curtain was now closed, and it smelled like rotten eggs really bad. To this day, I don't know what that was. I've never believed in ghosts before. I'm not really a spiritual person or anything of the sort, but I can't explain that. I worked security for a very large condo complex on the beach years ago. One morning at like 4am, the local police department called our gatehouse and asked if we'd seen anyone suspicious walking around with a gun, because they had a report of someone on the beach with one. The guard at the gatehouse notified the 11 other guards on the property via radio to keep an eye out for someone with a gun and to lock down the building lobbies. I was doing a patrol and at one of the pools and not any sooner than the radio call finished, on the other side of the glass wall was the person in question. As soon as he heard the radio, he put the weapon in his mouth and blew his brains all over the glass wall I was standing by. If it wasn't for the glass, his brains and blood would have been all over me. I calmly radioed it in and my backup guard came over ready for a fight. I want to say I was in shock, but 
that that week it was the third thing of significance that happened. The day before that, a car exploded on the property from a leaking fuel line. Luckily, no one was hurt. And the day before that, a police chase ended at the property, which involved four cars. The suspects were in a pickup that rolled like five times. Two of the suspects were in the bed of the truck and died on scene, and the other flatlined to the hospital. Me, being the security manager, I was stuck at work for eight hours extra doing police reports, and I was about to head home as I only worked nights when we were short staff. Back when my son was only about a year old, my husband worked second shift, so I was alone every evening. We lived in a townhouse at the time and had a neighbor who was a war vet that my husband was friendly with. He was a little off in the sense there was very obvious PTSD and other traumas, but he was an all-round nice guy. Anyway, one evening this guy knocked on the door. I opened it, thinking he probably was looking for my husband, and I was just gonna let him know he was working. The guy was really drunk. He wouldn't stop talking and kind of made his way into the house. He also brought his huge-ass German Shepherd with him. I was trying to be friendly, but I had the worst feeling in my stomach. I felt insanely vulnerable and like something just wasn't right with this situation. I kept trying to tell him in the nicest way to leave, but he wouldn't. I texted my husband, Hey, neighbor guy's here and won't leave. He's trashed. I feel really uncomfortable. My husband texted his buddies that live a few apartments down, and they came over immediately. They got the guy out of the house, and not even 20 minutes later, I hear noises outside, and this guy is trying to rip the license plate off of my car. My husband's friends must have heard it or saw it, I'm not really sure, but they came over and were more aggressive about him going home and leaving me alone. And he did, or so I thought. A few hours later, my husband gets home and sees this guy hanging out, crouched behind some cars. He goes up to him to ask him exactly what he's doing. I don't know the exact details because I stayed hiding in the house but this guy had ropes and some other weapon on him and full intentions of assaulting me that night. It makes me sick to think that if my husband's friends wouldn't have come over as fast as they did to help me, my poor son would have watched something horrible happen to me or even what he would have done to my child. Quite a lot of years ago, I was working at the Cincinnati airport as a ramp agent for now defunct Comair Airlines. I was working a departing plane by myself, so I was hustling around to get the baggage door closed, signaling the pilot on engine startup procedures, and I still have to unplug the power cart and marshal the plane out. The power cart was a diesel generator parked behind the starboard wing, the cable plugged into a jack on the plane's belly. The pilot signals me to disengage it, so I acknowledge him and run from my position in front of the nose, out toward the wingtip and back in, following the trailing edge of the wing. The exhaust from the turboprop engine is several hundred degrees, so you have to duck under the jet blast to reach the jack. I shut off the power cord, reached the jack, unplugged it, and threw the cable clear, latched the door, and then started running back towards the nose to get the plane rolling. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I had only a few steps left when my leg just didn't drop. It extended for such distance and time that I literally looked down at it, thinking, what the hell? My foot finally planted, knee locked, and I felt the impact in my teeth. My stride was interrupted, and I've literally been turned 90 degrees, now running directly away from the plane. 
That's when I realized my next step would have taken me through the propeller. That is the closest I've ever come to fainting. I have no idea what caused that change in stride, but I am certainly glad of it. This story isn't mine, but from a very good late friend of mine that I trust. My friend is an avid hunter and outdoorsman, literally born in the wrong era, like he should have been born a mountain man. He had his honey hole hunting spot. Every year he would go hunting there and get the biggest D4 zone bucks I've seen. He loved this spot so much, he would never tell anyone where it was. Well, one day we're all hanging out and he mentions that he has a new hunting spot. This is not normal for him, so we ask why he decided to switch, and he tells us this story. He gets to his spot. All is normal. He sets up his camp and sets out to scout the area. As he's walking, he smells something he's never smelt before. This guy knows this area and literally lives in a cabin in the woods. For him to smell something he's never smelt before is kind of a big deal. He shrugs it off and keeps hiking around. He said he kept feeling like he was being watched or stalked, almost what he would expect a deer to feel as he's hunting it. It got to the point where he decided to head back to his camp and call it a night. When he got to his truck, he found prints he'd never seen before, all around his truck and camp. He left and never went back, and the look on his face as he told the story was like none I've ever seen on him. He later found a new spot that he disclosed right before passing away that I'll be hunting with my dad next season. I am a 911 dispatcher, but one of the strangest calls I've ever encountered was spooky. So I was working the TAC radio one night in Broward County at around 3 a.m. This was about five years ago, and an 18-wheeler slammed directly into a box truck as it was getting off of an exit on the highway. Now this particular stretch of highway was very barren. The box truck damn near exploded, and the 18-wheeler chopped it in half. Three of the people were trapped inside the burning truck. According to the people in the truck, they were rescued by a man, and that man set them all neatly on the side of the road, and waited there with them until units arrived. Now, we sent the world to this accident, being that it was a vehicle fire with entrapment. Florida Highway came, as well as about three different jurisdictions of police and fire. By the time they got there, it must have been over a hundred units. A firefighter grabbed hold of the arm of the rescuer of the people to check him out, but when that firefighter turned around, the guy was gone. He vanished. We even had half of the units searching for him in case he was injured. No one saw that man ever again. Every time I tell this story, I get a mediocre reaction, but I'm telling you man, it was spooky. Like the guy was a ghost or spirit or something who rescued those people. This is a long story with a lot of details, so strap in, there's a nice payoff at the end. Like a lot of today I fucked ups, I was younger at the time, about 19 years old and I was working at an Italian restaurant in the town that I live in. I live in a decently sized beach town that has little to no crime and feels very much like a small town. The bosses at the restaurant I worked at were only a few years older than me and had hired me basically because I made them laugh during the interview. I realized this was important on my first day because basically every other employee at the restaurant were girls, hot ones, like it's hard to concentrate on what you were doing, hot. Of course my bosses did this so that they could hook up with them after work. 
and it worked. I regularly witnessed this process, so it was never surprising when one of them wouldn't show up and they'd hire another hot one sometime thereafter. I actually became numb to it. Instead of trying to act cool when a hot girl showed up for her first day, I was actually just cool about it, because I was never the one getting laid. The bosses monopolized every chance that walked in through the front door, so when one day, a mid-thirties supermodel-faced Russian girl walked in the front door dressed like me, I didn't even flinch. She was without a doubt the new hottest girl at that restaurant. But I was polite and said hi a couple of times to her, but ultimately ignored her the first few weeks she worked with me. Mind you, the restaurant was always really busy, and I knew that all these girls ended up hooking up with my wealthy, good-looking bosses. I knew my chances were slim to none. Why bother even trying? After a few weeks of basically ignoring this girl, I realized that every day we work together, she basically starts to follow me around. If I'm at the bar, she's at the bar. If I'm at a breakout back, she's on her break too. We start talking, and she's funny, and I like listening to her. So eventually I start giving her rides home from work and picking her up when she needs it, and thus begins the framework for the most insane hookup night of my life. See, this girl didn't own her own car, but lived in a nice house with a roommate in a nice neighborhood. The same neighborhood as my wealthy bosses. My bosses actually had to pass her house on their way home from work. The neighborhood was within walking distance of work, which is why she started working there. So we start getting closer, but like the idiot that I am, I never even begin to think there's a potential that I could hook up with her. I am sure I am completely in the friend zone. And I didn't care. She's pretty, and she's hanging around with me, and I'm 19. She's 30-something. I feel special enough. I also didn't think much of it either when I show up to work and start getting ribbed by one of my bosses about hanging out with her. He teased me in a fun way, and I deny there being anything between us because there wasn't. But after a few days of this, I noticed the boss who primarily hooks up with the girls watching me a lot and not being so nice to me anymore. I'm young, but I immediately understood the problem that I was creating. He hires hot girls and then sleeps with them. That's the routine. I'm fucking up his routine. The hottest girl in the restaurant is hanging around me and not him. Being that I like my job and make way more money than a 19-year-old should, I really start pushing away from hot Russian girl to the point of ignoring her. This was when I learned an early lesson about really hot girls, one you've probably heard before. Their entire adult life is riddled with guys who chase them, constantly pester them, and never leave them alone. For a guy, any guy, to completely ignore them is foreign to them. Paying them no attention will a lot of the time actually make them go after you harder, which is exactly what happened. So now it's becoming noticeable to me and everyone else we work with that this girl won't leave me alone. She begins to hang on me and tease me and do anything that will have me paying attention to her. On one side of the coin, it was awesome. On the other side, I could see my one boss's boiling rage that the younger funny guy he hired was beating him in the hot Russian girl game. And I wasn't just beating him. I was sweeping the series without so much as trying. So one weekend night, I show up for work and as soon as I get inside, the boss who has begun to hate me calls me into the office. By the way, the Russian girl's name was Anna. My boss starts a conversation with me. What's going on with Anna? He asks. I don't know. Did she not show up? I reply back. No, I mean with you and her. Are you guys sleeping together? So I'm young and smart and know when I shouldn't let people walk over me or intimidate me. I want to keep my job but I won't be a bitch about things either. So smiling, I say, 
I'm not sure if that's any of your business. Big mistake. The mistake that starts it all. Because he slams the papers he's working on down hard on the table. He turns around in his chair and says, Do you like your job? Do you want to keep it? He knows the answer, so I just stare at him. Well, then stop seeing Anna. Stop picking her up. Stop hanging with her every second that you're here. Stop allowing her to hang on you, or I'll fire you. Immediately I understand the depth of how much he's into this girl, and he's willing to fire me over it to get his way. And so, I agree. I make the decision right then and there that I'll keep away from her. Like I said, I have little to no chance anyway, and I'm making great money, whatever. The night begins to wind down, and I decide to go take a break out back. I've been ignoring Anna all night, and my boss is now thoroughly pleased with me. His master scheme has worked, and he can get back trying to sleep with the hottest waitress in the restaurant. So I'm sitting out back, not even thinking about the situation, when Anna busts out the back door and slams it shut behind her. She's evidently pissed. She walks right up to me and doesn't even fuck around with what's on her mind. Are you mad at me? She asks. No, look Anna, I like you, you're great, but us being friends is making shit uncomfortable with the bosses and I. They're getting pissed at me, I replied. Because our shitty boss wants to sleep with me, she pushes. Yes, because he wants to sleep with you, I confirmed. Do you want to sleep with me? She asks. This is the part in the movie where the record would scratch, and then the main character laughs uncomfortably, completely at a loss for words. Um, look, you're beautiful. No guy who sees you isn't attracted to you, I told her. I asked if you wanted to sleep with me. Yeah, I would, I confirmed. Good, then when we get off work tonight, Take me back to my place and we'll do it. And with that, she walks off back into the restaurant. I sit there, stunned in a haze. I'm pretty sure she's serious. I'm terrified. My life up until this point has been awful drunken hookups with high school girls at parties. I literally can't think, but I'm in. I'm solidly fucking in. Fuck my boss. This is worth losing my job over. So we wrap up, and she jumps into my car, and we speed off. It's only when I pull up to her house do I remember. Shit, my boss lives in this neighborhood. I'm pretty sure he has to pass right down this road when he goes home. This must be how he figured out she and I had been hanging out so much. I can't leave my car in the driveway. He'll see it. So she comes up with an idea I can't disagree with. There's a doctor's office in a business complex right across the street. I can park there and just run back over. It's perfect. So I get back to her house and walk in her front door and walk to her room. And she's standing in her underwear. It goes without saying that it's a memory burned into my mind. She takes my hand, sits me down on her bed and what follows is exactly what a 19-year-old kid dreams of. So it's about 30 minutes later, and the room is darkly lit. I'm praying to every major deity and thanking them that I didn't finish too quickly, because I want this moment to last forever. She's on top of me, and time is in slow motion. It's the greatest moment of my life at that point, which is why it took me a few seconds to realize I'm seeing flashlights on her ceiling. I'm also seeing flashlights underneath the door to her room. She notices them first. Then I'm snapped back to reality. She starts to freak out. It's obviously flashlights pouring into her house. Being that I was the guy and the guy is always supposed to protect the girl, I run naked to one of the windows. I look outside to see, and I'm not exaggerating here, 10 to 12 police cars with their lights on. In my peripheral, 
I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. Slowly approaching are five officers dressed completely in SWAT gear. My only rational thought is that I'm watching all of this and I'm naked. My member is no longer ready to go. I grab my boxers, throw them on, and go to run back to the window. They're at this house, but this can't be for us. I'm confused. From outside, a man yells, Burlington Police, open the front door immediately. The house is surrounded. We have a canine unit. We will send him in if you don't comply. I don't even think. I'm not a guy who gets into trouble a lot and have police officers in my family. If the police tell you to do something, you do it. End of discussion. So I run to the front door. I swing it open, and I'm staring at about 20 officers, SWAT included. I'm inside of myself now. I put my hands up and go to speak when a hand comes out of nowhere and whips me to the ground. I'm in my underwear. It's raining. I land in a puddle, hard. I heard Anna scream. The police rush past and enter the house. What the fuck is happening? I'm cuffed. There's dogs barking. A knee crushes into my neck and I'm thrown into the back of a car while I'm asking what is happening. A few minutes pass and I turn to see Anna's roommate and Anna, who's in my shirt and a towel, talking to the police. They're both cuffed. I'm sitting in the back of a squad car for about a minute when I glance across the street and see three more police cars parked next to my jeep, where I had parked in the business complex, that perfect parking spot to hide from my boss. Then it dawns on me. It wasn't a perfect spot. Because it was well past midnight, we work at a restaurant that doesn't get out till late. So I parked my car in an empty business parking lot late at night, got out, and ran around the side of the building. Mind you, I'm dressed in black from my job, late at night, running around the side of a closed building. That probably looked pretty suspicious to the elderly security guard who patrolled the complex at night, so he made a call to the sheriff. So I know you're thinking at this point, well there's no way this many officers, let alone SWAT, would show up for this. But they did. And here's why. The security guard went to the building to play police officer while waiting for the cops to arrive. He got out his flashlight and went searching apparently from building to building, looking into windows. He at one point climbed up on a bench and looked inside a window and slipped and his flashlight crashed into and through a window. So now the alarms have gone off. When the police finally show up, he completely neglects to mention He's the one who set off the alarm. Being that he's old, I've kind of forgiven him since then. So when the cops go searching the buildings, they not only find a broken window, but know someone has attempted to get inside. Obviously. But they can't find me, because I'm across the street having the greatest night of my life. So they call the K-9 unit for a search which just so happens to be doing a late night training operation with the local SWAT team. What a better way to train than to do a real world exercise with someone breaking and entering. But it gets better. Her roommate drove a really nice car, an older Mercedes, a Mercedes that had just recently been in a minor car accident the week before. Damage to the driver's side of her car, not major, but a nice little dent. So when the canine sniffs and tracks me past the building, right up to the house I'm in, they now see a car that looks like it's been kicked in, and a house with basically no lights on in it. They treat the situation as if I could be running and trying to get away from them. Which gets us back to where I'm at. Soaked, in my underwear, in the back of a squad car. Now I know this has been a long story, and if you've stuck with it, the payoff is coming right now, and it's an amazing payoff. When I'm pulled out of the car, I explain the same story that Anna has told them. My boss told me to stay away, and so I parked my car across the street to get laid, basically word for word. The look they all give each other was priceless. 
all cherish that look forever, but they now realize they fucked up majorly, but they don't want to admit it just yet. There's about ten cops standing around me outside of the car. The SWAT officer asks me, how the window get broken? I don't know. I didn't touch anything. I just ran around the side to her house, I replied. Another officer butts in and says, the security guard just told us he accidentally broke it. He didn't tell us that earlier. The SWAT officer then asks, so you're over here, kind of hooking up? Yes, sir. We work together. We just got off of work. That's why I parked there, I told him. The second SWAT officer asks, She's like in her thirties, you look about sixteen. I'm nineteen, but yeah, she's older than me, I replied. Wow, the first SWAT officer replies. A couple of chuckles, then silence. Seriously, good for you, man. I'm amazed. You're on another level than I was at your age, the first SWAT officer tells me. They then begin to apologize and begin to say things like, You understand we were just doing our jobs. We didn't know what was actually happening. You could have been dangerous. And blah blah blah. So I tell them not to worry and that I have police family members and completely understand. I won't be suing them or filing reports or anything. I just want the cuffs off. So they continue to be extra nice as they turn me around to take off the cuffs. So the payoff I've been talking about, the amazing kicker to the whole story. When they turn me around, I'm now facing back out across the street, in my underwear with the cuffs still on, and I see both my bosses pulled over on the side of the road, sitting on their side of the car, watching the whole thing. How long they were there, I don't know. There were so many cop cars in the street, they had to stop and wait. I was fired coincidentally within a few weeks. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Taylor Ruist Alex Monica Levelace James Gargano Sarah P Fire05 Mad as a Felter Tierra Sanders Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Letitia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Up, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Atwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, 
Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant, 44, Sona, Scout Mom, 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindop, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zeferano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.